Hello and welcome to the April edition of the Organic Gardening Podcast. I'm Fiona Taylor and later on I'll be joined by my colleagues from Garden Organic, Chris Collins and Dr Anton Rosenfeld. Spring has begun, the weather is getting slightly warmer, we're seeing those sunnier days and it's time to sow. There's plenty to be getting on with in the garden and there's still loads of time if you haven't started yet. Later on, we'll be opening up the post bag and answering your questions on how to take care of moss in the garden and what could be causing damage to your narcissus buds. And Chris finds out all about growing pulses from Josiah at Hobmadods. Now, some news from Garden Organic. We're thrilled to have been chosen as one of Yo Valley's organic charities of the quarter. This means that from April to June this year, if you collect yokens, you can donate them to Garden Organic to help our work promoting the benefits of organic growing. We'll also be featured on their Dairy Go Round competition later on in April. For more information, visit yovalley.co.uk and click on the orange yokens button. Also, we're delighted to announce new sponsors for the podcast, Andermatt Home and Garden. We've recently started to work with Andermatt using their plastic-free insect netting at our demonstration garden. The netting is made from plants, so it's completely biodegradable. And they also do a plastic-free fleece, along with other sustainable products. They've given us a 15% discount code for our listeners. Just visit their website, andermattgarden.co.uk. That's A-N-D-E-R-M-A-T-T, garden.co.uk. And enter the code ORGANIC15 for a 15% discount. Now, I'm off to join Chris in our potting shed here at Garden Organics HQ in Wrighton. Hi Chris, how are you? I'm good Fiona, how are you? Yeah, very well, thank you, very well. Delighted that spring has finally arrived. Yes, isn't it great to see us? All the blooms are suddenly coming out. Those are what I call the early birds. Yes. You know, so we've got the magnolias in London have been in full flow. In fact, they're even starting to go over, you don't get that. Two weeks of excellence, don't you? Yeah. But to me, I've got been an ex-parksman. All the shrubs, early spring shrubs are flowering. You've got all that bright yellow of Forsythia. You've got Shinomalies, the red, the qu- Japanese quince. Mm. Ribes, the ornamental currant, which has got that lovely cascading pink flower. These are old friends to me, and, uh, and they're all going for it at the moment. And I have seen the bees out already. We've, we've got a lot of flowers on our rosemary. I, I've got a lot of rosemary in my garden and a couple of bushes that really absolutely love where they're positioned. And they're covered in those lovely, tiny little blue flowers. And I've seen the bees just coming out. And it's just so satisfying to know you've got something in your garden that's helping. Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, so as you say, they, they do come out early. You provide the pollen. Yeah. Oh, I see it in London. All the dandelions are out. So they're covering all the roundabouts and the verges. They come out en masse, don't they? And you can hear that whole lot buzzing, basically. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you can. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Have you been busy? I have. It's been a weird start. It's saying about... The flowers coming out, but it's been very damp, very wet. Really wet. So I was looking at my photos of my allotment last year, and I reckon I'm about four weeks behind. Oh, but, really? Yeah, at least, at least. I think I've gone down there quite a few times. Uh, I've been so busy, I've not had masses of time for it. So I popped down a week ago, and the ground is very, very soaked. And obviously, if I'm treading on that, I'm damaging the soil structure. And so I've just got to be patient. It'll catch up. I know it will. Yeah. But I've just yeah. got to hold back a little bit. So there's not a great deal of uh, progress on the allotment. I've obviously got all my plants inside which yeah. ple- pleasing mrs collins as usual <laughs> in the front room that's this is all your, all your seedlings all your you know getting all your your, your food crops going yes. inside yeah so, germinating them inside yeah. and then growing them on a bit yes yeah okay so i've got a lot of tomato a lot of aubergine a lot of chili all going all in the front room basically but i've also got quite a lot of bedding pl- half hardy bedding plants i've got morning glory a load of them growing so i'm sort of ch- chugging away at it and it, they'll be ready to go when the t- when the conditions are a bit more favorable yeah, well, we, we're, we're here chatting to each other in the potting shed here at Wrighton, and it's the most tidy potting shed ever. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's, but it's so yeah. inspiring. All the tools are properly kind of oiled and ready to go. All the pots and seed trays are all stacked in, in size order. The potting bench has got its notebook there so people can note down what they've sown. It really is inspiring. But I also note that there's a little heater in here. It's just a plug-in kind of radiator, but it sort of reminds me at home, I have got a, a bit of a dilapidated greenhouse, but it's a greenhouse nonetheless. But I tend to plug in a camping radiator yeah. in there, just one of those tiny little, they almost look like joke radiators, you know, a little tiny thing, but it just takes the edge off. I mean, are you finding that 
the warmth indoors is key at this point. Certainly for those long-term, sort of long-season crops I've mentioned, you don't want to be putting them out in anywhere near the cold. I think it's not just also, it's not about so much temperature. It's the winds that would always worry yeah. me. You know, if you get a lot, a lot, bit of an easterly wind, a cold wind, yeah, yeah. you put an aubergine outside now and you get that easterly wind, yeah. it will just fry it. So yeah. even, I remember last year, everyone put the potatoes out, their earlies out, and we got quite a cold wind late April and it burnt the whole foliage. So, so timing's everything. You kind of use your knowledge a little bit. I'm not on the allotment at the moment because I can see the ground's too wet. I'll wait for it to dry out yeah. uh, and then I'll start to operate. And it is that whole thing at this time of year about don't rush into it because actually you could really regret it. Yeah, well, gardeners are it's amazing for such patient people. We're really impatient this time of year. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so true. true. Yeah, it's just the yeah. contradiction is immense because yeah. you want to crack on, you want to get on with it, but you have to be a bit of a weatherman as well. And, uh, yeah. and I know, even though I'm looking at allotment and it's quite wet, it'll catch up. By June comes, I won't even remember how wet it was because yeah. everything will race on. And it's a lot of it's soil temperature as well. That's why I never put runner beans and uh, courgettes and those plants out right till the end of May because I know the soil will be warm then and they get away much quicker. Yeah. Let's talk about grass because that is the thing at this time of year where it could do with a bit of attention. But again, if it's really, really wet, obviously you can't cut it. It can be looking a bit ragged. You're quite keen to get that first cut done so that you can actually see where you need to pay a bit more attention in certain areas. Mm. What what would you be recommending at this point? Well, I, I certainly wouldn't be getting on it when it was soaking wet, no. that's for sure, because okay. you'll just compress the soil and you'll impede drainage, and drainage is what turf not loves the most. Right. So you, you definitely wouldn't be doing that. You, it, it's, it's amazing stuff, grass, because you, you, you can turn it around so quick. As soon as that temperature gets over five degrees centigrade, you'll start to see it grow. Yeah. You know, and if you're worried about wetness, uh, just let it wait, get, wait till it dries out. Give it a day when it dries out. The big mistake a lot of people make is they'll cut it too close. Yeah. You know, go out with your mower, your brand mower, you like, you know. Yeah, yeah. Of, yeah. Springs here. Yeah, I'm going to cut the grass. You know what I mean? <laughs> you got and, uh, to. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. yeah. And then they shave it really short, the grass, it just checks the growth. So I would only cut it by half the first cut. I really yeah. would, yeah. And if you've got drainage problems, give it a spike as well. and. Let's let the, let the water through it. So, but don't you don't have to rush, but definitely stay off it if it's too wet. So, one thing I did do in the last couple of weeks was I I had a bit of time to really give my house plants a bit of attention, mm. and it was one of those kind of warmer days, and I left them all outside in the rain so they could they could get that kind of spring rain. I do believe that rainwater on houseplants is key to you. Yeah, well, yeah, definitely. In London, I definitely would because it's got really high pH, you know, yeah. and it's full of calcium and they add things to it as well. And, and it's not always possible, but if enough, I can't get rainwater on it, I always let my water s- distill. I'll let it stand in. I've got demijohns yeah. and it sits in there for a few days before I use it, basically. So if you can use rainwater, all the good, you know, yeah. it's not really, we haven't got enough of it at the moment, is it? So One thing I did want to ask you is what you sow into, because we're in the potting shed here at Wrighton, and we sow into a whole bunch of things, but we are using paper recycled pots. We do make a lot of our own pots out of newspaper. Mm. We've started playing around and, and experimenting with pots made out of wool. <laughs> what are you using? Well, I use, I mean, obviously, I recycle. I've got a lot of plastic that I've bought stuff in over yeah. the years and I've recycled all that. Yeah. yeah. And I wonder yeah. how long I can go on with that because it just gets bigger and bigger the pile. Yeah. I'm sure it does for a lot of gardeners. Yeah, it's a I do, big problem. Yeah, it yeah. is. I do use recyclable pots that will rot away and I like to use those for things like who don't like re- root disturbance runner beans for instance so I can then just sink the pot straight in all my parsnips go in in toilet rolls Blue rolls yeah yeah yep. and so if I can use cardboard that will rot down I will use it and I'll use it for plants that aren't keen on root disturbance basically yeah, yeah. that's okay. that's the key for me um, yeah I think if you, you prick out and move on a courgette or a squash or a or a runner bean, you can just see straight away they don't look very happy about it. I use ribbed pots as well. They're really, really helpful. You can get recycled card with ribs with a long funnel, and they're really good as well. Okay, so what are we going to sow in April? Well, well, obviously all my salad beds will start. All those sort of things will start. So it's time for me. All the root crops, my carrots, my beetroots, my radishes, they're all going. Spring onions will go in. Chard, rocket, all that will go in. My tatties will go in as sets. I know that's not seed, but they'll all go in because I tend to leave them a little bit later. Uh, My broad beans, they're all germinated. I'll germinate them. I'll put all those out as well. Quite a lot will go on, definitely. Quite a lot. Half hardy hands, I'll continue sowing them. So I'll I'll put those in propagators. So I will definitely get that going. Uh, All all my onion sets will be all going in, that kind of stuff, yeah. Okay. You said half hardy annuals. Go on, give me some of those. (laughs) Which ones are well, they? Well, yeah, things like petunias, pelagoniums, yes. uh, lobelia, stuff that needs a little incubation period. 
bit like your runner beans, but I'll keep them warm until I know the frost has gone, then I'll plant them out. And they'll all go into my hanging baskets, my half hanging baskets. A lot of that stuff will end up on the balcony. Yeah. I mean, this is the thing, isn't it? It's, it's you know, we say don't rush it. You know, we say hold back. But then what does happen is that there is a bit of a backlog inevitably and because you've got to kind of really go for it now. Yeah. Yeah, it, does. I mean, it, it depends on what level you want to do it at. I've got yeah. a full-size allotment to, yeah. to fill and a big Plenty balcony to fill. Yeah. So I will go at it, yeah. But I mean, yeah. even if you're just doing a little bit of seed, so just a little salad bar in a window box, it's, yeah. uh, you could do that. And also, I like repeat sowing anyway. So every few weeks, I'll, if I'll repeat sow as well, especially if it's herbs like basil, coriander, yeah. I often repeat sow those. I enter sow, so I'll put in salad crops and then I'll, I'll leave a good gap between the two rows and a drill and then I'll re-drill in between them so it perpetuates, basically. Yeah. So we're talking quite a lot of direct sowing this month then. Yeah, so it'll all be drills. Most of it will be drill sowing. I'll have stuff in the propagators, yeah. but there'll be I'll have a two massive days on the allotment when it's dry enough where I'll put all the pollinator borders in, my, my hardy annuals. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> my hardy annuals, and I'll put all, all the drill sowings for root crops and salad crops. So it'll be... Bent over, bum in the air for two days, basically, okay. if you can. <laughs> okay, all right. So let's talk. Let's uh, just expunge that from my mind for a moment. Um, I'm now actually quite interested in what you're going to do to the soil before you do that. Well, I'll be very sparing with my compost. So, and I don't like to interfere with the soil too much. It'll be forked and it'll be raked and it'll be consolidated. Okay. That's what it'll do. So I don't want to I'd operate a no dig where I can. I have got areas of, of horsetail where I, my pecs, where I put yeah. on the top. But I'll give it a light fork. I'll get the back of my heels on my yeah. feet, take all the air pockets out, and I'll give it another rake. Then I'll put all lines down. I usually put, I've got a bit of spits of cane bamboo and lines. I'll put those all down the distance I want to go, and then I'll drill so into that. Okay. All right. So let me confess, my bed that I will sow veg into, there's a fair bit of annual weeds on it, and I'm not pulling them out just at the moment because I'm kind of thinking... I want to keep the soil covered. Yeah. But my plan is, so tell me if this is the right way to go about it. My plan is to quite soon, before those weeds get too big, yeah. is to pick a couple of days and and prepare the whole lot. So I, I will pull all those yes. weeds out. Yeah. I will then rake and then yeah. do what you're saying. Yeah, consolidate is quite yeah. important. Yeah, then, yeah. Because uh, where I went wrong last year was yeah. I thought, oh, no, I want to leave the soil covered right to the last minute. And, yeah. and then it's just I could never get back on top of it. So I am going to spend that time. You, you have to get in with the, with the annual weeds particularly. You have to get them before they start to flower and set seed, basically. Yeah. And you have to be aware of how effective they are. So like a, like a chickweed will set seed, germinate, flower and set seed in just three weeks so yeah. they're incredibly effective at yeah. colonizing their ground and if you get a load of them doing that then you're in a battle all summer basically i must admit i'm quite jealous of people who've got chickens because you can just let the chickens loose can't you and then they yeah. just scratch up the whole bed for you, you can do, that's one way to do it there's quite a lot of foxes on too my many lot, foxes <laughs> as well, exactly. you end up being Same somebody's problem. lunch i think <laughs> <laughs> um obviously big time for wildlife spring is springing you know? yeah what can we do around encouraging and supporting the wildlife in our gardens at the moment? Well, so obviously you made things like if you if you want the more larger animals, building hedgehog hotels will be quite hedgehog houses is quite a good thing to do. I've had hedgehogs on my allotment with me and Peter, my neighbour. We've had two hedgehogs move in, and that was quite a simple thing. We made a hedgehog uh, house out of bricks and there's a long entrance. That was that's really exciting. <laughs> obviously, put your bird food out. I don't feed them during the, the when the spring really kicks in in the summer. It's when they fledge. I'll certainly I'll put my bird food out as well and plant pollinator friendly stuff. You know, Lamia maculata, the dead nettle, absolutely loves that. Leave the dandelions in the ground here and there. Yeah, make sure they're getting looked after as well. Yeah, so you can definitely it, it, just give it an area. And the big one is you know. Make sure you're not putting down stuff that's going to drive them away. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. that's that's the big one. Leave leave some habitat piles. Leave a little pollinator corridor down the side of your your veg bed, and that will help out. Now, obviously, I know with the allotment you haven't got many trees, and obviously none on the balcony. And um, but if people have got trees or hedges, how can they be mindful of nesting birds at this yeah, time of year? Certainly, well, I mean, you don't want to be really leave it till the end of May. I think let them fledge because they will start to do that now. Yeah. I've got baby robins already on my on my balcony. I know, so they, oh, so they just look ridiculous because they're all fluffy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. But uh, yeah, definitely be aware that fledgling is going on. Yeah. You know, and also it's quite yeah. good for the hedge if you let it break properly and not shave it back too properly. You want it, yeah. you don't want to, you know, attack it too early in the game, I don't think. Um, yeah. Obviously, yeah. in bird, bird, bird boxes high up in trees, bat boxes maybe they're yes. a good idea. Yeah. You know, south facing yeah. bat boxes is quite a good idea. 
But yeah, you can certainly do, do these little things to help out. I mean, you've got the ultimate one really in a way because you've got a pond and yeah. that pond really attracts wildlife. Put a bog garden in next to it as well if you want. That really attracts wildlife. Uh, apparently, if you if you pond, the best time to see it is at night if you go out with a torch because it's absolutely alive as stuff. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, that's a great idea. But as you know, it's been a total joy. Any springtime harvests? Have you been pick, picking no. anything? <laughs> no, I'm not. I've, I've had a little bit of salad leaf. I've had some pea shoots because okay, uh, yes. I grow them in the house. I grow yeah. them on the windowsill. Yeah. My main focus at the moment, apart from the seed, getting all the seeds on the go, the ones I can at the moment, has been my, my gorilla garden area because I've been putting all the bulbs off the balcony out into the car park for about four years now and it looks incredible. The tulips are out very early. Loads of tulip out, lots of daff. I've got a lot of hyacinths there. They're amazing for bees, by the way. The bees love the hyacinths. But I've also been throwing all my hardy annual, my famous hardy annual seeds. Again, must get sick of talk, <laughs> me talking about hardy annuals. But I've thrown them on them and I've got things like loving a mist and calendula. And poppies have all really started to establish in it as well. So that's been giving me a lot of pleasure, that yeah. that area. Yeah. And my neighbours, all my neighbours love it as well. So yeah. it's quite a lot of camaraderie created out of it Yeah, as well. yeah, yeah. No, that's lovely, isn't it? I mean, we have enjoyed all sorts of primroses have come up in my garden. And of course, there, those flowers are edible. Yes. Yeah, rather nice. Yeah. I talked about the rosemary flowers, also edible and absolutely lovely. Lovely little, very delicate flavour, but, but really gorgeous. I've got a few leeks that I can still harvest, so that's good. I've got a number of overwintering herbs that I've used. I did quite well with parsley. Yeah. I've got some pots of parsley, so I've been continually harvesting those, which has been great. There's something about having something every day, isn't there? Yeah, there is and, if you can manage it. Yeah. So I pulled my last parsnips out a couple of weeks ago, and it was quite a sad moment. Yes. But it's also that yeah. transition period. Yeah. I'm in that period where I still I can still dig potatoes up. They're all yeah. still there, but yeah. I'm looking to get going again. I really am. Yeah. I, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it, I, that allotment, I eat off it eight months a year, and it's all yeah. fresh, and it's all organic, and it saves me a fortune in cash. But, I, you know, you've got a graph to get it, but it, it's... It's such a nice thing to be able to have access to. Isn't it? Just the total satisfaction of it, frankly, of, of something that started at this time of year as a tiny seed. You know, you often say you can hold, do, yeah, it. I hold it all in my hands. Hold it a whole lot in <laughs> yeah, your hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. You know, a yeah. whole lot in your hands I, I this time of year. I, I like the way also it's made me think about I'm a better cook than I used to be because you grow you grow it and then you're like, well, I want to harvest it now. And then you start thinking, oh, what can I do with it? Yeah. And, so you still, it gets that whole other side going. The two worlds of eating and growing overlap, but that's quite nice. Yeah, definitely. And lots to look forward to. I'm I'm inspired by your salad bar. I need to crack on and, and, and sow some salad. I'm doing all my sowing in the next few days, but I'm kind of a little bit frightened of that moment when you've actually got too much going on almost yeah. and you've got all these little seedlings and, you know, do you pop them on? Do you not? Do you put them out? Do you take them in? Do you, you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, there's that kind of frenzy, isn't it? But it lasts about six weeks. I yeah, find. it is. Yeah. And it's, 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 they put them out is quite interesting because hardening off is a real gardener's skill because yeah. you go, well, I need, I need to harden them off. And you put them out, you don't realise how cold the wind is. And certainly plants like tomatoes will, will fry in a cold wind. So you kind of really got to look and judge, you know, is it time for them to start hardening them off? Can I stop exposing them to the outside elements? And so that's just a, an experience you build up over years, I think. Yeah, definitely. It's a lot of babies to take care of, you see. That's what it is. It eh? is. It's springtime it's, babies. Parents to a thousand seedlings, you know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Our special guest this month is Josiah Meldrum, part owner and founder of Hodmodods. Hodmodods were founded in 2012 with a mission to get farmers across the UK passionate about growing beans and pulses. Chris and Josiah chat about our changing attitudes towards these plants and how Hodmodods are encouraging farmers to take an organic, sustainable approach. Well, welcome to the Garden Organic podcast. And today I've got a real tree on with Josiah Meldrum from the interestingly named Hodmodods. Did I pronounce that right? Yeah, that's spot on. I've been Curious as anything, my opening question was, where did that name come from? Ah, oh, thanks. Yeah, it's an East Anglian dialect name. And when we started thinking about some of the crops that are disappearing in the UK, we thought it'd be nice to pick up a name or a word that's also disappearing. And a lot of our dialect words are sort of drifting away. And Hobbitog means snail or hedgehog in East Anglia. How many people would know there was an East Anglia dialect to start with? You know, you kind of think of it. Think of uh, languages being so homogenised now, don't you? It's absolutely right. I mean, they've got love of lovely words. Bishy Barney Bee, that's a ladybird for your garden. <laughs> I love that. Bishy Barney Bee. 
Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's going to stay with me, my friends. That really is. That's going to stay with me. So you've got this amazing business. Give me a bit of background on that. What got you interested in and how did it start? Yeah, so myself and a couple of friends, Nick and William, were working for a small non-governmental organisation in East Anglia, looking at food systems and how we might engage more directly with how our food is produced, how we might improve how our food is grown. And we did some work with a community group in Norwich who asked this really interesting and very kind of provocative question in 2008, which is, could a city the size of Norwich feed itself? And if it did that, how do we have to change our diets and how might we have to change land use? And we did a big bit of research for them, which looked at, you know, land use, dietary requirements, all of that kind of data, and came to the conclusion that Norwich could feed itself from a relatively small area, a surprisingly small area we found, 160,000 people, but that we would need to change our diets. And one of the key findings was that we needed to grow more leguminous crops, those crops that fix nitrogen, which I'm sure all of your gardening listeners will be well aware of, and that we needed to be eating more plant-based protein and less meat because of the nature of extensive agriculture and, and intensive agriculture. And beans and peas and, and lentils and chickpeas do all of that stuff. You know, they, They're a fantastic source of protein and nutrition more broadly, and they're fixing nitrogen and they're building soil organic carbon and they're holding water. They're doing amazing things. And we thought we, you know, the, the Norwich group then said, can we make some of this a reality? And some of the recommendations that we'd made around horticultural production were relatively straightforward, setting up a community garden and working with a, a couple of growers and growing food for 150 families. But the beans bit seemed really hard. How are we going to encourage Norwich to eat beans when we don't like beans in the UK. We're really low per capita consumers. What do you what do you think causes that? It's interesting. I, I was lucky enough to spend time working in Africa where meat is a real commodity in the bit I was in. So they all eat pulses. It's a really big part of their diet. Do you think yeah. you've fallen away from that because we're overwhelmed with choice or maybe our love of burgers or whatever, or you know, the more salty or sugary items? Yeah. We've kind of lost that appetite for plant food, basically. I think there's a whole host of reasons. I think one of the one of the critical things is that we industrialized really early in the UK. We got rich and we learned how to farm differently. We learned how to keep livestock through the winter months, which is quite an expensive thing to do energetically. If you needed to eat beans and peas in those dark winter months, you were probably poor and they very quickly became stigmatized and they fell out of our diet. When you look around the rest of the world, you know, the Mediterranean, Mexico, they love beans and they really treasure them as part of it. The only bean that we eat in any volume, is the baked beans. We eat more baked beans than anyone else in the world per head. <laughs> where, that's amazing. And where do those are those beans British grown, or are they coming in from? No, nothing about a baked bean is British. You know, Heinz, <laughs> you know the Heinz beans. They, they came over in the late nineteenth century, and they were an American import. You know, white beans from around the Great Lakes area in in the northern US. Tomatoes imported, but we just took them to heart. And post war. When they'd taken out the meat, because that was expensive during rationing, and the beans were just sort of white beans in a sugary red sauce, they just became a really cheap, affordable food. There was a marketing campaign around beans on toast, which really embedded them in UK culture. And we've never never looked back on that from other beans. We just... We just, we just not... Yeah, it's not... Yeah. I mean, you always think things like, you know, lentil, all this sort of stuff, all those sort of things are kind of looked down as... You know, a bit bit hippie-ish, aren't they? I suppose that's kind of that's got you now. Everything succumbs to image, doesn't it? Yeah, there's a big role in it. That's that's one of the things that we considered. You know, when we were doing the Norwich project, you know, the the barriers, the the hair shirt seventies image of pulses really doesn't do them any favors. And I think what's changed in the UK, and quite extraordinarily, really, when you look at it, is you know, in the sixties and seventies, in that immediate post-war few decades, we had this terrible reputation for unadventurous eating and bland food. And yet in the last 20 years, we've just become very, very diverse in our dietary choices. We, we're one of the places where food marketing businesses come to test things out in the UK because we're very adventurous now, which is quite surprising. And I think, you know, all of the global food that we eat, and particularly North African and Middle Eastern food, which people like Yotam Otolenghi, a food writer and chef in London, you know, really popularising dishes that require these these beans that actually we're really good at growing here but we don't that's amazing so we're on the up then in far as pulses go so oh, and where's okay. the company at today how i mean it's looking pretty successful isn't it so the, after the community projects which was 2008 to 2012 we set up hobmadod as a business to carry on the work that we'd been doing because we'd become 
uh, being evangelists really we become so <laughs> kind of so kind of dedicated and committed and fascinated by the the potential for systems change dietary change farming change you know they are a really incredible lever for change uh, we set up the business in 2012 and to start off with it was something we did part time we did other things at the same time and then but for the last 8 or 9 years it's been it's been a full time thing and it's the interest has grown extraordinarily from from beginning where we were told by you know food writers and chefs you know you're never going to make beans popular and pulses are you know that they have this image problem to now i think you'll see them everywhere and it's not it's not just us it's a broader change so last year, our sales were fifty percent. So you, you, obviously, you recognise there's an appetite for it by the sound of it, and, and then it's just grown from there. You work a lot with farmers. How does that happen? What's your relationship with farmers like? Yeah, so I think that that began very early on, and and again, this realization that pulses are this incredible engine for change led us to realise that if we were to engage directly with farmers and ask them to grow particular varieties, we could use that to help them change their rotation to bring broadly a kind of ecological value to the farm but also a better economic return and historically the things that we're really good at growing here are peas dry peas and and fava beans but dry peas in particular the uk is really well placed climatically to produce them and yet organically certainly when we started there was no one doing it and the reason being that the imports were just 10 15 20 pounds a ton cheaper and that is enough to flip it from being worth a farmer doing to not worth their doing because it requires a bit of extra attention and care producing for animal feed is much easier so by working directly with farmers we have a group of about 35 we are able to ask them to grow in particular ways particular varieties and we can communicate that to our customers you know we can offer that transparency by eating these peas you're helping i don't know mark lee change the way he farms and that's a really positive bit yeah, of engagement certainly. Yeah, it really, really is. It's a strong message. And these 35 farm, farmers you work with, were they difficult to eke out, find? Because a lot of farming obviously can be quite industrial, but you've got a lot of smallholders as well. And you're going for those smaller farmers. And that, that, they're the people you're sort of aiming at. Mm, we have a big range of farm sizes. And I think the, the one thing to say about these broadly combinable crops, crops that are harvested with a combine at the end of the year, is that they do require actually some scale to make them work. So for most of the farmers that we're working with, you know, anything less than about five hectares isn't really worth their while doing other than if it's a trial because of the time and attention and the, the costs of doing that. There are crops that work on a smaller scale. Some of the very high value fasciolus beans, so French beans, runner beans that we might sell as a dry bean, and they are, as a rule, hand harvested. So those are much higher value and they do work at a smaller scale. But yeah. In terms of finding the farmers, I remember, you know, right at the beginning, you know, we go and talk to local farmer groups back in the in the early 2000s when we started the project in Norwich, and we'd explain what we were proposing to do, and they, it's a lovely idea, lads, but it's never going to work. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we were the sort of lay entertainment at the end of a, a local farm group meeting or whatever. But now we get called all the time. We get calls every week from farmers. So actually, we haven't had a problem finding the farmers, but what we've been keen to do is find farmers who have the right set of skills to grow the crops that we're interested in to the standards that we need them to for human consumption. Sure. Um, so is, is it important yeah. to you that these farmers are practicing organically or sustainably local produce? It, it, yeah, so it's a, it's a mix. So quite a lot of them are organic. But what we're interested in is farmers that are interested in, in making a change broadly, a change to an agroecological form of farming. So low input, taking the community around the farm into consideration. And I think that's something that farmers are increasingly interested in. Some of those have converted to organic through the process of working with us and we help them to we help to demonstrate to them what the benefits and the advantages of that are, which is quite a powerful thing. I think we could have just worked with organic farmers right from the start, but I think that would have really limited our opportunities to support change. Sure. Because those farmers are already kind of there. Is there savings to be had? Because it obviously you mentioned the legumes, which have got rhizobium, which are really good for the soil. Is there savings mm. to be had if you're practicing soil health as opposed to artificial fertilizers, I suppose, because you're growing a crop that can then be dug into the soil, can't it, or turned into soil? I think that's something that's become increasingly a consideration, particularly, you know, nitrogen prices, for example, synthetic nitrogen, which as we know is between, depending on which figures you look at, between two and 4% of all man-made climate change emissions. I mean, it's extraordinary, really. Yeah. 
and it's and it's increasingly expensive. So yeah, farmers are looking at the benefit of those leguminous crops, not just the harvested pulses, but also cover crops that contain things like sandfoin and clovers and vetches, and also undercropping living mulches of clover that grow underneath the cereal crops, all of which are bringing that nitrogen benefit. A lot of that nitrogen obviously is fixed within nodules on the roots of the plant, but the plant is pushing essentially sugars into the soil, root exudates as they're called, using photosynthesis, which are then fe feeding these rhizobians, these bacteria that can then turn them into nitrogen. And that they're feeding not just the ones in their nodules, but they're also feeding free living bacteria. So they benefit a wider range of crop species. And some of it's left in the soil after harvest. So depending on the species of legume, you could be getting quite a significant amount of nitrogen for the crop that you plant immediately after that that pulse or cover crop. What a brilliant, that's a brilliant bit of botany. I loved every word of that. That's just so good. That's a good description of it. So I'm interested, you mentioned species. So what, 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 have you got some interesting varieties of say pea and stuff that you grow? Yeah. So, I mean, peas are amazing. And the reason why they're so amazing in the UK is that our climate means that they're almost 100% self-fertile. They pollinate themselves before their flowers are fully opened. And the advantage of that means is that you can grow lots of varieties next to each other without concerns about them cross-pollinating. So from a breeding perspective, they're quite stable in the field. At any given time, we might have anywhere between seven and 10 different varieties of pea in the bean store ready to go out. And they are old-fashioned dark peas that would have been recognized by our kind of Bronze Age farming forebears through to really modern ones that have, have just been kind of identified. Like there's a pink pea that we sell, which is very high in beta carotenoids and has pink cotyledons. You know, they have a load of different uses. I mean, I think we, we're used to the sort of brightly colored beans and the range of different beans that you get in the Fasciolus family. But peas have a similar diversity and, and different uses that you can put them to from hummus through to we roast them and fry them and, and sell them as a crispy snack as well. So are there any problems you come across uh, with growing beans in this UK, say with the climate or anything like that? What difficult, If I had li people listening to this and they were going, well, I fancy growing farmer beans at home, are there any essential tips you would give them? Well, I mean, it's a really good question. The question about climate change and what we're going to grow and all that kind of, and we do often get questioned by, you know, journalists or, you know, we that see us as potentially some kind of answer to the problems that will come with climate change. You know, are we all going to be growing chickpeas? They're looking for that silver bullet. Is it all going to be lentils? And of course, the answer is what it should be is just a greater diversity because that's where the resilience comes from. By, by not putting all your eggs in one basket or all your peas in one pot or whatever the metaphor is <laughs> that you, <laughs> you want to use. And I think it's that diversity that makes it exciting, but there are real opportunities to, to do different things. So fava beans, for example, field beans, tick beans, they've got lots of traditional names, really, really easy to grow in your garden. They're essentially a small broad bean. You can eat them like a mange too. You can take the pods when they're yeah. very, very young and steam them. You can eat the tops and they're delicious as well. And they give you a nice kind of wintry bean flavor out, out of season. And you can leave them to dry on an allotment or a garden. I think with all of these crops, because they are, they, they are grown at scale and the harvest is, the yield is relatively low against land area. Growing them at home is, is generally a kind of a nice thing to do, but you're not going to feed yourself through the winter from a plot in your back garden. <laughs> yeah. So it would be a treat then, wouldn't it? No. It's interesting you're saying about, I, I always think on my allotment, I, I hedge my bets. I don't plant too much of one thing. I tend yeah. to montage it. Then so, because the weather's unpredictable now, I, I, I might have a bumper Tommy tomato and aubergine. Yeah, I did in London mm. last year or another year, mm. it might be brassicas. So you do need to kind of mix it up, don't you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you can mix it up, as you say, through time and across space, you know, so you can grow different things in different areas, but you can also grow things together. And that's what's increasingly happening on arable farms. The use of bi-cropping uh, or even polycropping, where we get, you know, several species into the same field, sometimes all of which are harvested, sometimes with the with the living mulches where they're they're just providing soil benefits for the for the crop and for the following crop. But yeah, so peas and cereals being grown together, it's very common. Peas and beans and it's, it's the historic way of doing it. You know, what, what in Middle English are called maslins, which is a, an old French word for mixture, were really, really common. And 
the the idea is essentially that something's going to work and you spread your risk by growing more than one thing in the same field. Yeah, sure. And then also you've got the advantage, haven't you, of if you're undercropping and stuff, you get the weed, keeps weeds down yes, and the less exactly. irrigation and all these other practices. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah. So, so you, what was the most unusual crop you sourced? Oh, well, there's so many, to be honest. But, there, uh, well, pick your favourites out for me. Yeah, I'll pick a fun. few things that are, I think are, are really interesting. So when cereal crops are growing in the field, or any crop for that matter, there are, there are things that farmers like to call weeds. We, <laughs> yeah. like to, we, we like to think of them slightly differently to that because they have often have a useful function in the field, either as an indicator of soil health and changes that might need to be made. But also the the subsoil, the root soil root interactions can be really, really beneficial for the crop as well. And some of those things are edible. And it's really interesting to think about how we might get these accidental harvests. So this year, from one of the organic farmers we work with, we've, we've separated out the poppy seeds from red poppies from his oats. And they historically have been eaten and they st- still are eaten in parts of Europe. They're not the big blue poppy seeds. And we're looking at we're looking at using those for baking and for for other ingredients. So that's a kind of accidental crop. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, because you get it in bread, don't you, or on the top yeah, of rolls yeah, or poppy exactly. seeds, something like yeah. that. And then I tried growing rice in my back garden. That was I harvested less than I planted. That was one. <laughs> we'll probably not multiply that up to field scale, but it's a fun experiment. And there are some some North American high latitude rice varieties. They're still significantly south of us, but but they they grow well enough, particularly in a polytunnel because they flower late and it's fun just to see rice growing. Yes. <laughs> um, and then there are things like, you know, lupins and chickpeas, the lentils, which when we started, there was a general consensus or a feeling that they couldn't be grown in the UK, but they that we now grow them on quite a number of farms and we've kind of worked out the agronomy. But yeah, there's 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 so much potential actually in all this diversity. And discovering things that can be grown here is part of the fun of it, to be honest. That's amazing. No, it's interesting because places like Portugal grow rice, don't they? So you think it'd be yeah, you think it'd be feasible, wouldn't you? That you can't move it around, but that that'd be great to see how that gets on. Um, um, so, I was, so I was wondering, so have you got sort of any tips for the grower? If you were doing that little back garden, have you got any sort of a, a, a pulse if pulse tips? And they like it wet or dry, or does it just is it all down to the microclimate they're in? Yeah, to a certain extent. I mean, most things are actually relatively easy to grow if you put your mind to it. I think I think the thing that people kind of miss a trick on in the UK is runner beans. So in the UK, you know, we tend to think of a, a runner bean as something you harvest green through the summer and it's delicious. And But the rest of the world don't do that. They tend to eat them dry. So if you go to Poland, they've got a fantastic tradition of growing and harvesting these delicious white runner bean seeds. If you go on holiday to Greece, you'll have Yagantes, which are those giant beans that they love. And in Mexico, where runner beans originate from, they're always eaten dry. And they've got, I think in the Mexican seed bank, I've got 900 accessions, 900 right. different types, and they all suit different geographies and different uses. But we tend to just strip them off the canes and put them on a compost heap. And I would just encourage everyone to save those beans and eat them. You know, the scarlet runners, the, the white seeded beans, they're absolutely delicious. And that's a really easy way of, of adding a little treat to your sort of winter stews. And I think People do that to an extent with French beans. There's an assumption that, that a, a crop only has one use when, in fact, it can have multiple uses. Mm. So when you get bored of picking French beans, you know, uh, late in the summer, just leave the plants, let the pods go leathery, and you've got a delicious bean. And don't don't worry about what what the stated use on the packet was. You can eat them dry. Don't don't be put off. Right. It's true, isn't it? We just eat everything. We, it's well. I remember when I was a younger, my grandmother would cook runner beans, and not that she would cook them for green, but she'd cook them to death as well. So <laughs> I, swear, I swear, if they're dry, they probably retain their nutrients a bit better as well. I should imagine. Well, what what's interesting is obviously what we when we eat green beans or peas or any of those crops that you might you might shell and grow on the allotment, they're not really fully mature. They've got lots of sugars in them, which are delicious. But what happens when they dry out is that those sugars turn into amino acids and other storage carbohydrates, which are actually a lot better for us and more nu- nutritionally dense. Bees love them. I, You know, you can climb yeah. inside them and the bees are, it's like a bee rave yeah. inside yeah. them. And so it's, so just think about them a bit more laterally is what you're saying, I suppose. And also it means you, if you're drying beans, you've got stuff you can eat through the winter. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the interesting thing, you talk about bees and bees do like them. They, they don't tend to be strong enough to open them. So they tend to bore into the base of the flower to get the, to get the nectar out. And, and runner beans have evolved to be pollinated by large night-flying moths. 
and by hummingbirds, amazing. Wow. And in the <laughs> southern US, they grow them as a hummingbird attractant in their gardens, which is which is extraordinary. I mean, <laughs> is. I'm, seeing, I'm seeing them in a whole new light, mate. I really am. Well, that's, that's an amazing chat. I mean, I've always liked pulses, but I'm even more sold on them now. And I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna be a bit more adventurous with it the allotment this year, maybe. I'll try a, a one or two different things. Listen, this is a wonderful thing you're doing. If people want to find out more about you, I take it you'll have a website. Do you want to give any contact details, social yeah. media? Yeah, so we're just we're we're Hodma Dodds with an S on all social media, wherever you want to find us. And we are hodmadods.co.uk online. So come and find our website. We do a lot of home deliveries, so and we've got a lot of products, so people can easily make up an order and get it sent home. We're also available in Holland and Barrett, so you'll find our, our pulses in Holland and Barrett as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Josiah, for giving up your time. Chris, can you give us that again? What is the name the, for the ladybird? I love it. Bishy Barney V. It's an app on it, isn't it? <laughs> I'm going to call on that from now on, mate. I've, I've expelled the word ladybird in me. Bishy Barney V is from now Bishy on. Bishy Barney V. <laughs> I, I don't know, I just love that. That's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> but, I mean, what was really fascinating was, you know, learning more about growing pulses. How did you find that, Chris? Well, he was so passionate and, and articulate about it. I, yes. I came away from the interview just determined to grow more pulses, to be honest yeah. with you. Yeah. And he's a typical of a gardener. You'll see at one point he's talking about, I said, what do you try out that's unusual? He's trying to grow rice in his back garden. Yes. And I just like that curiosity that, that, that gardeners have, you know, yeah. to try stuff out. But he's also doing a really important job. Because obviously, you know, he's growing local and he's looking at how, you know, how we feed ourselves locally as well. So there is a bit of politics behind it as well as the growing, I think, to a certain degree. And the fact that in thinking about food source and where it comes from and how it benefits the local population. So I was really impressed with the guy, I must say. I really yeah, was, yeah. Yeah, we're joined now by Anton who's got quite a bit of experience of, of growing pulses. But you've had a real go at this, haven't you, Anton? What have you enjoyed the most in terms of growing pulses? Oh, that's a difficult one because I enjoyed so many different ones. Um, yeah, wow. Perhaps one of my highlights would be growing green chickpeas. Okay. I think if if you're going to grow pulses at home, you want to grow something that's not really sort of cheap to get in the sh shops. You want something that's perhaps a little bit unusual that you can only get from your garden. So the green chickpeas is a really good one because I've never seen them in the shops. Perhaps... Occasionally, I see them at a certain time of year in some of the sort of Asian shops on a certain street in Coventry, but not usually in the supermarkets. Well, I think you need to educate us. What is a green chickpea? So a green chickpea is, is basically just a chickpea that hasn't been allowed to mature to its sort of dry okay. yellow state. I'd say it's not worth growing chickpeas for dried chickpeas because you can pick up a sort of pillowcase size bag for yeah. you know not that much <laughs> yeah. money but growing them for a green crop they have this delicious sort of slightly fresh pea but sort of nutty taste to them as well which is like nothing else i've really tasted so that's it's really worth having a go at them so describe to us what a mature chickpea plant looks like and how you actually therefore would harvest them in the green okay so a chickpea is actually quite a low-growing little bush and it has white flowers on it and you'll end up with lots of quite short pods on it. Each pod will either have one, two, or if you're very lucky, three peas in it. Okay. And basically you just want to harvest them when they're still fresh. You can feel them in there, give them a little squeeze and you'll find you can feel that the pods are sort of developing you don't want to eat the pods, they're not nice to eat, but you just eat the peas when they're still green. And I think they're really delicious roasted. That's a really nice okay. thing to do. There's a traditional thing to do, if there are any pyromaniacs amongst our <laughs> listeners, is you get a wheelbarrow. Uh, and make sure it's a metal one, not a plastic okay. one. Okay. <laughs> Fill it full of twigs. Lay the green chickpeas on the on the top in their pods and then you start a fire with the twigs and that roasts the wow, so chickpeas <laughs> in their pods and they're really delicious. That would liven things up no. on a Friday night. They look And they would indeed. Are they difficult to grow? Do you grow them from seed or how? I've never grown these before, so I'm going to go away and do it. So you, you grow them from seed. What about the maintenance of the husbandry of them? So actually, you'll find a lot of Indian and Bangladeshi people already grow them on allotments and they get their seed from just buying a big 
bag of dried chickpeas. So we're not really sure what variety we've got, but they do seem to grow pretty well. You can either start them off even directly from about sort of April, May outside, but I tend to do them in trays first. I find you get less problem with mice that way because you're making a very sort of nice snack for a mouse by putting <laughs> these sort of slightly soaked chickpeas in the ground. So yeah, I'll just start them off indoors about sort of April time and put them out. They actually can take a bit of frost as well, unlike a, a French Quite a tough plant you're taking there, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. And do, does it keep yielding? I mean, is it, it you know, is it one of those things you keep keep yeah, in the pods and do. then it, it keeps yeah. it keeps going? Yeah. So, so the season would go right through what, till sort of October? Yeah, as long as it, as long as it doesn't get too cold. Okay. Yeah, you seem to do it pretty well. I'm going to give this a go, I think. Got to give yeah. that a go. So, I mean, I've gone and bought you know, a bag of dried peas and, and had pea shoots off them. So I know that, that dried veg, it can often be very viable, which is really interesting. You, you said right at the beginning, you wouldn't necessarily recommend people to grow things that you can get hold of in large quantities and that are cheap in the shops. Have a go at something that's a, a little bit more exciting than that. But we get a lot of inquiries about growing your own lentils. What do you know about that, Anton? So this is something we tried at Garden Organic a few years ago. We actually got some of our members to try it at home as well. We tried two specialist varieties of lentils as well, ones that have got a really nice taste. So they're the sort of dark brown um, puy lentils. I mm. think there's two varieties called Anisia and Flora. And again, they grew really quite well. They were very easy to grow. But in terms of harvesting them, I've never come across across such a faff because basically <laughs> you've got basically about two or three lentils in each pod. And you can just imagine so when you get long. that big bag of lentils from that, from the shop then, someone spent a long time putting that bag. There's a lot of threshing <laughs> going on, isn't yeah. there, I think, yeah. You need a threshing machine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I did put some of them through Heritage Seed Library's sort of seed sorting machine and that speeded it up. There's some sort of, a, of a machinery, I suppose, but it would maybe yeah. be beneficial. Yeah, I suppose yeah. it's the yield, though, even then. You know, if you're getting two or three lentils per pod, I mean, how many pods are you getting on a plant? I can't remember. I didn't count them, but it was... I, I, not enough. No, <laughs> not enough to make it worthwhile. We, we, I mean, we've got a small bag of lentils off a plot, basically. So. Yeah. And when you thought about, you know, you spent a whole summer doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but I learned how lentils grew, which was, I, I suppose you could see it. That yeah, that's, not, I, that's what yeah. tempts me. I just want to see how it happened. We don't come across these plants so often, yeah, do we? Yeah. So it was a curiosity again. Yeah, yeah, and sometimes you can interlace your flower beds with these sorts of plants because they're, they're, yeah, they're a bit different and they look... What kind of, what, can you remember the flowers, the lentil flowers? They were sort of pale blue coloured. Oh, okay. oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right. Well, we, you know, we might give that a go also. I mean, I think there's a lot of talk around beans at the Heritage Seed Library, but we have never really talked about what was said in the interview around actually drying your own runner beans and using, using the beans inside the runner bean pod. I mean, we're much more used to growing the pod, harvesting the pod, mm. you know, chopping it up, boiling it. But there's something interesting there. Well, we eat green, don't we? We always see them as something you eat green. And, yes. and he, he was a big advocate of, of drying beans and eating them like that. And obviously most of Europe does. I'm pretty sure you'd know all about dry beans, wouldn't you, Anton? I'm sure you tried that. Because it's about extending your season as well and not just eating everything in a glut. Yes. I think that's, that's the right thing because, I mean, during the summer, you end up with these gluts and runner beans is one of them. And runner beans is quite a multifunctional crop, really, because you can start off by harvesting them when they're green and... And then perhaps by sort of halfway through the summer, you just can't keep up with picking them. So if you leave them on the plant, they produce a really nice plump bean because they're slightly bigger than the sort of French beans. And so they're really nice in a stew when, once you've dried them. And, and then you've got these beans at a time when you haven't got so many other crops as well. Mm -hmm. So you, like you say, you're spreading your harvest. That's a really good. That's what they would have done originally, wouldn't it? You'd have cropped a load and that would have been your winter feed. You get exactly. them through the winter. And they also, they don't freeze very well, do they? So you, it's a much better idea to dry them. Yeah, much more ecologically sound as well. You're not using I tell you what, as well, they, the bees love runner bee flowers, don't they? Yes, it seems like they for do. Yeah. So, and that's a, a plant we're used to growing and, and, you know, we know how we're going to do that. Now, talk us through drying beans properly because this is this is my own personal kind of dread is you know it's all going to go a bit moldy and it's just not going to quite dry out and I'm not going to be sure when it's dry 
enough to then put it in the jar, et cetera, et cetera. What, what are the top tips for drying beans? So the ideal situation is if you can let them dry on the plant. Right. Obviously, with our climate, you can't always predict to be able to do that. So if you can pick them as late as you can, and then you want to then leave them in a sort of pretty warm, dry place. I mean, a greenhouse, if you've got one, really works very well. So yeah. don't shell them. No. And then that's really interesting because that's yeah. a slightly different method to what I was imagining. Okay. Yeah. I, I let them mature in the pod as, for as long as possible and then shell them. Yeah. And and there's something we must just quickly then pick up on is that once you've then dried your beans successfully and then you think, right, jolly good, I'm going to have some beans. Actually, how do you rehydrate them? I would soak them overnight in cold water. You can speed that process up a bit by soaking them in boiling water that, and then you don't need to soak them for quite so long. And then I think a pressure cooker is a, such a worthwhile investment yeah. for boiling them because you do need to boil them for probably about an hour to get them really sort of tender, whereas in a pressure cooker you can do it in about sort of 20 minutes so you're saving on your gas or electricity. You do yeah. need that vigorous boiling for at least 10 minutes f- mm. to destroy any possible toxins in there and and then you just need to sort of simmer them until they're soft. Okay, but that's quite important, isn't it? Yeah. To make yeah. sure that they're safe to eat. And and would you then eat them just as a side dish or would you stir them into a stew or do you then, you know, do you kind of coat them in spices and roast them? What do you do? Well, it's, those are different sort of things you you can do. We're coming round, you know this, don't you? We're going to come round to yours for a run a bean feast. I mean, certainly during the winter months, we we tend to get quite a lot of sort of root vegetables as well. So I'm quite a fan of just putting them all all together and big really stew, a nice yeah. stew. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Then you don't have to cook for several Ooh. days. Well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know. I, I sucker for those fava beans. You know that they're all sort of fried up and roasted and gorgeous um, yeah. coatings on them. Absolutely love them. Well, that's been really an education. Thanks ever so much. Right, time now to answer some questions that have come in to us in this month's post bag. So first of all, do you have any advice on how to get rid of moss on vegetable plots? The plots aren't raised but have wooden surrounds and the moss has been getting worse over the years. I live in Devon which can be damp a lot of the time. Well, let's stop and think about moss for a minute. Anton, first of all, what is moss? So moss is quite a primitive plant which sort of thrives under really damp conditions. It's very shallow rooting and it reproduces through spores, which usually they form in the spring and sometimes in the autumn as well. And so people often worry if they are going to be sort of pulling it up or putting it in their compost that they're going to be spreading the spores around. I think that's something that's quite difficult to avoid anyway. What you really want to do is try and make sure that you don't recreate the conditions that's really favourable to moss. You want to Mm. try and sort of, basically you've got a drainage problem and you want to try and sort of alleviate that. So they like it damp and, and dark or light or how does that work? They tend to thrive a little bit more under darker conditions, but that tends yeah. to be just because those conditions tend to be damper. The water hasn't evaporated from the soil surface. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's quite interesting that it's coming back year on year, but obviously it spreads quite easily because of the spores, as you're yeah. saying. It's not that difficult to, to pull it out, presumably. No, it's you very know, shallow rooted. Shallow rooted, because there, there was another question about whether it has roots or spores that go deep into the soil. I suppose the spores, do they survive over a winter? As far as I know, they would do. They would probably survive in your compost as well. But like I say, if you haven't got the conditions where they thrive, then it it isn't really a problem. Yeah. It's the conditions that you need to be modifying. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, it's quite interesting to think that on a veg bed, you've got moss. I mean, I imagine it in, you know, dark corners or, and I've got it in various corners of my greenhouse. But it, it's quite difficult to imagine it in an open vegetable plot. As you say, not too difficult to get rid of. A fantastic resource, though, moss. I mean, what would you use that for, Chris? Well, certainly I do use uh, yeah. moss quite a lot. If you've got a if you've got a lawn that's on heavy clay, it's more likely you'll get moss in it because yeah. obviously, the, the, as, as Anton says, it's a drainage problem. Yeah. 
So I would certainly use use it in my hanging baskets. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's that. So it's a sustainable sort of source, isn't it? In yeah. many ways, but it is there. Is there? It's an indicator to me. So if you, if you're getting it in your veg bed, it means it's not draining properly. So it's not, you don't have to worry about spores. It's, that's irrelevant. It's about stopping the conditions, as Anton says, in the first place. Okay. So I wouldn't worry about putting on the compost bin or anything like that. But what I would try and do is aerate my soil. That's right. what I'm going to do. You might as also, the bare of the soil, if you're leaving bare soil over winter as well, you'll get a thing called capping where the soil locks on the surface and it stops, stops the drainage going through, the water moving through. Moss will love that. It's perfect for a mossy oh, okay. So maybe a, a green manure, a mustard, something like that might help that. Also making sure, yeah, that, that soil's composted. The same rules we always say, keep that soil nice and healthy, broken up, get the leaf roots in, let the water move through it. And that moss will just give up then. It will go off and find that dark corner you was describing. Yeah. And grow over there. Yeah. So yeah. it's about, yeah, you don't want it in your veg bed. No. So make sure that soil's draining okay. They do have their place, though. I think they are the most lovely plants. I, I absolutely love them. I mean, you, you of course, have some fond memories of them from your time in Japan. Well, yeah, they're, I mean, they're just such beautiful, beautiful things. They really are. And, uh, and you, you grow them in Japanese gardens, you'll see them. They're a very important part of it. You'll see them growing on the rocks and the stone, and they'll grow in the shady conditions where there's a lot of water movement. And they're very beautiful. There's a guy at Chelsea, isn't there, who does them every year where he just does these amazing balls of moss. And they've got their place, but, you know, you don't want to around your carrots. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we did just talk about getting the drainage right and also maybe making sure that your soil is covered in the winter with a green manure. Any particular green manures that you might recommend, Anton? It depends slightly on your soil type and what you're going to be doing with it later on. But anything that's got quite a lot of fibrous roots on it is quite useful. So grazing rye is quite good. If you've got a really compacted soil, I find that alfalfa is quite a good one. It's got a sort of tap root which busts through mm. sort of compacted soil as well. But I think anything just having a root system in there and having some plants over the winters break up that rainfall and stop it gluing that surface together and sort of reduce the chances of that capping occurring. Right. Okay. All right. Right. Well, on to our next question. Composting. We talked a lot about it last month. This is a specific question as a result of that podcast. I want to change to a hot composting system and I was trying to decide between hot bin and green Joanna. Having listened to the March podcast and read the article in your latest members magazine, I'm beginning to think that as an older person, I might struggle with the physical effort required. Is either bin easier to manage or should I just go on using my basic compost bins? We do talk about, you know, empty compost bins and there's a lot of physical activity that we talk about in a bit of a generic way so first of all just as a recap Anton can you just tell us what is a hot bin and what is a green joanna so a hot bin is a bin that's made out of polystyrene it's very very well insulated and it processes particularly food waste really really quickly the green joanna is a bit like a dalek bin Mm -hmm. but it's actually considerably larger And it has thick walls, so it keeps really warm. And it also has a solid mesh base, which keeps the rodents out. And that allows you to put food waste in it. So I would say that you do not have to have this physical workout with your composting. That's the number one thing I would say. It will just go slightly slower if you don't do that. I personally just tend to put my veg peelings and garden waste into the compost bin And then I just give them a small turn to mix it in with what's already there. I don't turn the whole thing. I've got Mm. a bad back as well. I don't Mm. want to be reaching down and and doing that. I would say that the green Joanna is slightly better if you want to do more garden waste. It's perhaps a little bit less fussy than the hot bin. The hot bin is really good for more sort of food waste materials it it processes those really quickly so really it's probably more comes down to a choice of what you want to be doing with your compost bin what you're going to put in it and what you want to get out of it right but actually the principle is if you leave it it will still do the job by itself yeah okay just takes a bit longer okay thank you very much and finally my narcissus buds look like they're being eaten from the inside What's causing the damage and is there anything I can do to stop this? Goodness me, it sounds horrible. Well, first of all, Anton, what's your punt in terms of what's doing the damage? I think, unfortunately, this is one of our common friends, the 
sna snails or slugs which are doing this. The problem is at this time of year, you get quite a few little baby ones which are really quite yes. small to yeah. see, but they got quite big appetites. So <laughs> they they quite hard to sort of deal with, really, especially if they've sort of got into a place where you can't get at them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's definitely mollusks, we think, slugs and snails. Goodness, well, we've had an awful lot of rain. It's It's been incredibly wet. I mean, there must be something around what do we need to do now to avoid them really taking hold on the plot through the year. Chris, any suggestions? Well, I would certainly look to make sure that the plot was nice and hygienic, basically. I don't want old pots lying around anywhere where they can gather and lay their eggs so that you get your babies. So I'm quite clean in my, my, on my allotment to stop that happening. I remember when I moved on to it, they put a path down and it was all old uh, roof tiles with some tarpaulin and there was a population the size of London of snails underneath. <laughs> yes. And it just showed a really good yeah. example of how if you give them the areas to, to congregate, then you'll get more problems. So the, the hygiene rules is, is a nice one to say because just keep your mind tidy and try and reduce the risk. I also remove mine with tongs especially this yeah. <laughs> they all go in a bag and walked off site so we have got this i think you're going to take a bit of a hit sometimes and it has been incredibly warm and incredibly damp this is a perfect storm really yeah for, for narcissus and but it's quite interesting you might and next year they might not touch the narcissus i think this year they've decided to feed on that mm. particular plant so hygiene pick them out if you see them maybe you want to put some barriers up i don't know but i wouldn't sweat it too much because uh i'm sure they'll be back next year you know daffodils will look fine yeah okay all right. Well, that's that's good news that it's it's not all over for the narcissus, and maybe next year there'll be beautiful flowers on them with no damage at all. Okay, that's terrific. Thanks ever so much. Thanks for listening to this month's episode of the Organic Gardening Podcast. Thanks again to our sponsors Andermat, who also do an effective organic slug control, Slug Less. It's an alternative slug pellet made up of straw, eggshell, and biochar, all things that slugs hate. Again, use the code ORGANIC15 for a 15% discount at andermatgarden.co.uk. And don't forget to check out the Yokan section of the Yo Valley website for how to support Garden Organic and sign up to their mailing list to be the first to hear about the Dairy Go Round competition. Thanks to Kevin McLeod for the music. That's it. Till next time. <laughs> <laughs>